I'm your host, Aaron Heath, and I'd like to take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 48 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 048. Well, we got a gun of the show again. It's This time, it's a Sig Sauer product. In fact, this one is a Sig Sauer P238 Blackwood. One thing you got to keep in mind is that Sig Sauer has a ton of variations, it seems, on everything they make. Well, the Sig 238 is probably the flagship of excessive variations. I mean, they got some weird variations. They got some crazy variations. They got some stupid variations. However, the 238 is a good gun. I mean, if you're looking for a 380, it probably is one of the best ones out there. It and the Glock 40. Or not 40, the Glock 41, or is it the 42? I think it's a Glock 42. But anyways, the little Glock 380, they're probably the two best, uh, eh, I'm going to say they are the two best in the 380 category. Well, let's go into a little bit of the history on this. I found this gun, and it was kind of a love at first sight type situation. I like the way it felt. It was basically a 1911 that got washed in hot water and shrunk down to a 380. The controls are essentially the same as a 1911. It does not have the grip safety, but, you know, a lot of people don't like the grip safety anyway. It is a single-action only gun, and it's carried in a cocked and locked, uh, cocked and locked uh, manner, so it may not be the best gun for a lot of people from a psychological standpoint. But keep in mind, when you take a SIG 238 with a thumb safety that's engaged, and you take the Glock 42... You put them in a holster, drop them in a pocket. The gun that's going to be easier to fire is the Glock. You draw it, you press the bang switch, where with the 238, you draw it, you depress the safety, and then you press the bang switch. Well, a lot of people think they see it, they see that hammer cock back, and they immediately have this reaction of, oh dear God, that's dangerous. They don't realize that it's actually easier to negligently discharge the Glock than it is the SIG. Go figure. But anyways, though, me and this gun, I've got a history with it. I love the way it feels. I love the way it shoots. And it was the main reason I got the 938 that I normally carry now. With that said, let me go ahead and run into the specs on the gun. The model on this one is the 238-380-BG. There is a model that has an ambidextrous safety now. That was not the case when I got mine. As I have mentioned, it's chambered in the 380 or the 380 ACP as it's more commonly known. It has a capacity of 6 plus 1, although you can get extended magazines. It is a single action gun. The sights are drift adjustable, SIG light night sights. It's got a number of different materials in its construction, including the wood grips, an alloy, eh, it's an aluminum alloy frame, as well as a stainless steel slide. It weighs in at 15 and a quarter ounces. It has an MSRP of $738. Or if you get the ambidextrous safety model, $766 for the MSRP. Personally, I'm going to say this again, but personally, don't hold any value to the MSRP value. You will find the gun for less than that in the wild. And you may be listening to this episode after the MSRP has changed. In theory, the MSRP could change between me recording this and me releasing this. However... That's it for the gun of the show. It's time to let you know how to get the podcast if you just somehow stumbled across it, and then we'll be back. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Well, isn't that interesting? We are all over the internet. Okay, I'm being sarcastic. <laughs> I do have a email from, well, he didn't want me to use his name. <clears throat> so we shall call him John, John Doe. Anyways, John Doe wrote in to say, I am a new listener and I visit your website late at night or early in the morning, depending on how you look at it. However, I have noticed things seem to be a little unstable lately. I think he may be referring to the fact that the theme keeps changing and elements keep moving around and things like that. Well, I have been getting the website ready for a redesign. In fact, 
Uh, <laughs> let me just say that the redesign pretty much is already in place now, and I hope you like it. With that said, I don't really have too much to say in the listener feedback arena. We did get some emails from some of the, uh, well, all or nothing crowd. I guess that's the best way to describe them. We did get some emails from them. We got some emails from a few other folks who, shall we say, are anti-gun. And in honor of our anti-gun listeners, I decided to do an episode for them. We're going to cover the anti-gun bills that are currently sitting in the state legislature. That's right. We're going to we're going to see what the anti anti gunners are up to after I let you see or after I let you know how to follow the show on social media. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook. You can follow it on Twitter. You can circle it on Google Plus, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. As I said, I have had some email from some anti-gun followers or listeners on the show. I really don't know how the anti-gun listeners can stand to be even listen to the podcast, to be honest with you. However, they have emailed me, and you know, mostly it's uh, war garble, guns bad, war garble, stuff like that, but... You know, I figure it's time to cover the anti-gun bills that are sitting in the legislature. And, you know, this is going to be kind of a nod to the anti-gun listeners. Although this episode isn't anti-gun, this bill just covers the, their activities. And first off, we have House Bill 155 by Johnson. Now, this particular bill adds an additional uh, requirement in order to defend one's property. Basically, uh, it, there are worse bills out there that are anti-gun and anti-defense. But we really don't need to go backwards on this. So this, like all the other bills we're going to mention in here, is a bad bill. Please, if you speak to your legislators, tell them any of these bills you hear on this episode are bad and they need to do something about killing them. Kill this bill. Make sure it does not survive. However, there is one other House bill. Most of the anti-gun activity is in the Senate. But there is one other House bill we want to touch on. And that's House Bill 1627, or 1627. Now, House Bill 1627 creates a duty to retreat outside of your home, making it illegal to use deadly force to prevent robbery and aggravated robbery. I mean, if somebody comes up to you and they attack you, you have a duty to retreat, according to this bill. If somebody comes up and tries to rob you, or they try to rob you with a weapon, well, you can't use deadly force to defend yourself. You might be able to... Slap them silly, but you don't have any legal authorization to use deadly force, even if you are relatively sure they're going to kill you. Once again, House Bill 1627 is a very bad bill. Kill it with fire. Call your legislators. Tell them if 1627 makes it to any kind of a vote that you have power with, vote against it. And now we're going to move on to the Senate bills. and. You know, there's really, I'm going to say there's four bills in the Senate. No, it's five. It's five bills in the Senate from two people. The first one is Senate Bill 124 from West. Now, I'm going to upset some people, but on Open Carry Texas's uh, Facebook, not Facebook, but on their uh, bill tracking page, they support this bill. However, this is an anti-gun bill. You see, this bill uses very vague language to make a firearm purchase. Um... Well, if you buy it under some very vague and ambiguous circumstances that are defined by this bill, well, uh, you're breaking the law. Now, I mean, it's dressed nicely where it looks like it's a good bill to keep criminals from getting guns by straw purchases. However, this bill would serve as a trap for unsuspecting gun owners because of the vague and ambiguous languages. This bill is supposed to make a criminal offense out of something that is already an offense under federal law. Let me say that again. It's going to make something illegal that's already illegal under federal law. And the bill has a provision so that it defers to federal law if federal law covers or conflicts with it. So this bill is pretty much useless. Hmm. Yeah. uh, This is not a bill to support. This is not a bill to push. This is a bad bill. 
it's not too bad because even if it's past, it's pretty much useless. But you know, the whole vague, the vague and the ambiguity, ambiguity, blah, let me get my tongue untied. The vagueness and the ambiguity that's in this bill, it could still be a very dangerous bill, especially if federal law changes just a little bit. Personally, this is another bill that needs to die. Preferably, it doesn't even need to make it to a committee, but it'll make it to a committee and it needs to die in committee. And then we get to the state's very favorite anti-gunner. This gentleman has never voted or introduced any kind of pro-gun legislation that I am aware of. However, he keeps introducing these very anti-gun bills. And his four bills that he's got right now are probably a group of bills that I think they're designed to work together in a way. So, let's take a look at the first one, Senate Bill 256. This bill would create a ban on the sale or transfer of magazines with a capacity of more than 20 rounds. Wait, 20 rounds? That's better than what uh, New York has with its 7-round capacity. That's better than California with its 10-round capacity. But 20 rounds? That's not better than, say, the 30-round magazines I have in my AR-15 or my FS-2000 or the 25-round magazine I have in my 6.8 SPC AR-15. Yeah, this bill, it's a, it's a bad bill. This bill needs to be killed in committee. Preferably, if we could, we need to kill it outside of committee, but it's going to go to committee, so let's make sure it dies in committee. And then we have Senate Bill 257. 257 makes it a criminal offense if you fail to report a lost or stolen firearm within 48 hours of the theft, even if you are unaware of the theft. This bill additionally requires the DPS to collect, analyze, and generate reports for data that has no crime prevention use. Okay, let's talk about uh, why 48 hours, especially if you're unaware of it, is a bad idea. Why should somebody be made a criminal for being a victim? Imagine if this was, imagine if this was a case of rape, okay? If, let's say somebody said she was raped, and then she suddenly gets charged with adultery. That would be outrageous. And that's exactly the same type of situation you have with Senate Bill 257. 257 makes it an offense to be a victim. Some people might say, well, you should report it after it happens. But you you can't always report it after it happens. Let's take some of these oil field guys that they, uh, out here, you know, they may work, say, four days on and then uh, two days off, and then they may have, you know, a stretch of days that are longer than four. So let's say they're off four days, or let's say they work four days or more. On Monday, they leave for work at six o'clock in the morning. That's about average, kind of. So they leave for work at six o'clock in the morning. At 930, when everybody else has gone to work, Little ga- criminal gangster hoodlum thug breaks into their house. Little criminal gangster hoodlum thug steals his guns and leaves. The neighbors see the doors wide open. The neighbor goes over, pulls the door to, thinking, oh, he just forgot to shut it on his way out to work. And this is, say, at lunchtime. So the neighbor pulls the door shut, nothing else of it. Then, that's Monday. Tuesday, he's at work. Neighbor didn't bother to call him, you know. Wednesday, he's at work. Neighbor didn't bother to call him. Thursday, he's still at work. Neighbor didn't bother to call him. At 9.30 Thursday, it's been 72 hours since his house has been broken into. And his guns were stolen within minutes or hours of 9.30. But it's been over 72 hours, and he's not even aware that his house has been broken into. He comes home Friday. He calls the police. The police ask the neighbors, well, have you seen anything in the last four days that stands out? Neighbor says, yes. I I saw the door open. I thought he had left it open, so I pulled the door too. That was about noon on Monday. Officer does the math in his head, says, okay. It's been 96 hours since that time, and, the, and he just reported his guns are stolen. Now, an officer doesn't have to uh, charge him with it. His supervisor doesn't have to force the issue. The county or district attorney doesn't have to force the issue, but... Let's say that they're, uh, let's say that they are either anti-gun or they're, they're running for office and they just want to have a, I'm taking a stance on gun crime position, or maybe, maybe just maybe they don't like the guy. Maybe they don't like oil filled trash and they want to run all the oil filled trash out of their town. Well, 
now you have him being prosecuted. They didn't have to prosecute him, but they do. Now, some people say, well, you know, most people don't work in the oil field. So, you know, this whole being at work for four days really doesn't apply. But what about vacation? You go and you, let's say you decide, I live in Amarillo, Texas, and I'm going to go to Houston. And from Houston, I'm going to go to Austin. And from Austin, I'm going to go to El Paso. And from El Paso, I'm going to go up into New Mexico, hit the Carlsbad Caverns. And from there, I'm going to go home. And this whole trip is going to take, say, a week. Somebody breaks into your house on the very first day. And guess what? When you get home and you report it gone, you become a criminal because of this bill. This is a bad bill. This is a very bad bill. Senate Bill 257 needs to die in committee. If we could make it die before then, we would, but this bill has to die in committee. And then we have Senate Bill 258. Senate Bill 258 is an anti-gun show bill. It would define a gun show in a manner where even flea markets could run afoul of this bill. It would require background checks for all sales in and around a gun show. And it would require the seller have access to the NICS system in violation of federal law unless they are a federal firearms licensed dealer. Now, the bill would also require the seller to keep records on the sale of a firearm without specifying what is recorded to be or what is required to be recorded or for how long the record should be kept. So let's say you sell a gun and 20 years later you decide, "Ah, I don't need this document anymore where I wrote down this guy's name, driver's license and phone number and you shred it. The next day, the police show up wanting a copy of that record because that gun showed up in a crime or it was stolen and they're doing a, you know, they're doing a trace on it. Guess what? You broke the law. Now, there are other bad features in this bill, such as a requirement that a gun show promoter give 30 days advance notice to local officials and law enforcement. But we've seen enough of this bill that we don't really need to concentrate on it very much. Senate Bill 258 by Ellis needs to go away, too. This bill has to die in committee. And finally, Senate Bill 259. This bill would would require the Texas DPS to operate as the point of contact for all federal NICS checks. NICS is the National Instant Criminal uh, Services, or Instant Criminal Checks Service, I believe. Anyways, I'm tired, and I really probably should take a nap before recording this, because my memory is foggy from it, from the exhaustion, but this bill would require the DPS to do these checks without providing them the necessary funding to fully uh, staff and implement this law. And by fully staff, I mean they would not be able to hire enough people to meet the requirements set forth to do this in a timely manner. Now, why is this a problem? Well, this is a problem because if, let's say you have one person doing all the background checks in the state of Texas, you want to have phones ringing off the wall 24-7 and you're not going to get anything done. Okay, let's say you have 20 people doing it. Do you know how many guns are sold in Texas per day? You're still not going to have enough people to take all the calls. As a result, you're going to have calls that are either unanswered or they result in delays in approval simply because the DPS cannot handle the volume of requests, especially if Senate Bill 258 passed where everything that happens at a gun show or around a gun show has to be uh, run. And I guarantee you, 258 and 259 are designed to work together. 257 is pretty much supposed to work with them as well. And then 256 is kind of like the uh, tasty pastry that you get for dessert. Overall, all these bills that we have discussed need to be killed in committee. If they can't be killed in committee, they got to be killed on the floor. But they cannot be allowed to make it into the other house. These bills have to go away. Now, I know I... Kind of, I kind of stepped on some toes with Open Carry Texas because one of the bills they support I've classified as anti-gun. That's okay. They want to support gun control. They can support gun control. In fact, I don't even care what OCT does as long as they just behave themselves. Well, actually, I do care what they do because they, when they support this bill, they can, uh, well, they can actually give it legitimacy that it does not have. So no matter what anybody tells you. House Bill 155, House Bill 1,627, Senate Bill 124, Senate Bill 256, Senate Bill 257, Senate Bill 258, and Senate Bill 259. Anytime you speak to your legislators, kill these bills.
Well, with that said, I think it's time to wrap up the main topic because I want this to be a short episode, shorter than normal. So I'm going to run the contact audio, let you know how to get in touch with me. And after that, I'll come in and hit a very short news segment. Instead of our usual three-story news segment, I'm going to do a two-story news segment. And then we'll wrap the show up. With that said, get ready to contact me. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. All of our news in this episode, all two stories of it, is political. Now, we have a story where State Representative Garnet Coleman has introduced a bill that would eliminate the Texas version of Stand Your Ground. That would be House Bill 1627 that I have mentioned earlier. Now, the Stand Your Ground provisions would be eliminated outside your home, vehicle, or place of employment. It would eliminate the protection currently enjoyed by Texans to defend themselves when they are in a place where they are legally allowed to be. Billy, where they are legally allowed to be. Garnet's House Bill 1627 would expand the number of criminal-friendly zones in the state of Texas, making it easier for criminals to rape, murder, and commit other violent crimes. Many thanks go out to Nancy, who sent that in to me. Nancy was kind enough to actually write that whole thing for us. And in fact, if you want to see how Nancy wrote it, you can uh, go to the show notes, which are at gunrightsintexas.com slash 048, and you can see her writing of the, uh, well, the writing of that uh, teaser on the news story. Our second and final news story is where we have a story about the Mexican army. You see, the Mexican army killed four gunmen, and they seized a number of weapons, including two belt-fed machine guns. Weapons like these could easily be smuggled into the United States by the drug cartels, just as drugs are, and then they could be used to kill or terrorize American citizens. A large number of legally armed citizens serve as a deterrent to such... uh, Blah. Sorry about that. I hate reading these, but uh, Nancy once again wrote this one and sent it in, and it was written well enough I just simply... Sent an email to her, told her I was going to credit her for both of them and read them. So I apologize for reading it wrong. Now, the last sentence is, a large number of legally armed citizens serve as a deterrent to such potential threats. And she's right. But I'd like to point out that the fact that these guns are sitting on the border, they did not come from the U.S. If it's a legal machine gun, it was made prior to 1986, and it was registered prior to, prior to that. And the problem is, if you got this legally registered legally owned machine gun it's so expensive to buy that it's not worth it when you can go get one on the black market in mexico for a lot less why would you spend twenty thousand or more for a for a used 30 year old machine gun when you can go spend a couple hundred bucks at the uh on the black market where a deserter brought the same gun in from uh from the military when he deserted well you wouldn't These guns actually came from somewhere in Mexico on the black market. Gun control doesn't work. Gun control never has worked. It never will. And this article is pretty much proof of that. With that said, let me say thank you to Nancy for sending me the two news articles. And Nancy, if you want to keep doing this, I'm more than willing to to just cut and paste your email into the news segment. With that said, please stay safe and carry responsibly. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly.